Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome to Old Stone Presbyterian Church. Welcome to this worship for this Easter Sunday, the Sunday when we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord, April 4th, 2021. My name is Anna Pinckney Strait. I am the pastor of Old Stone Presbyterian Church. And whether you are joining us through this YouTube video or on the radio, it is good that we are together. I hope that you'll follow along with today's service using the bulletin that you can find on our website, oldstonechurchwv.com. I also hope that you'll consider joining us next week for worship and the weeks after. There are many ways you can do that. You can gather here in person. We are following social distancing guidelines and wearing masks. We are not engaging in congregational singing at that, this point, but we are here in person. We are also live streaming that worship service on our YouTube channel, where you may be watching this video right now. So if it is not time, if you do not feel it is time to return to the sanctuary, you can join us and watch the service as it happens. And as has been our long-standing tradition, you can also listen to our worship services on the radio. Wherever you are, however you have come to be with us in worship, it is good that we are together. Please join me in the litany for Easter. He came from God to speak words of love. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. He traveled and spoke and healed and listened. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. To all who would follow, he promised life. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. For every child of God, he gave his life. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. The good news has been given to share. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. We are Easter people. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed.
The Easter story begins in such stillness. An early morning, heavy hearts and slow feet making their way toward an immovable rock. But the women arrive at the tomb only to find out that the body and the story they thought it held could not be contained. Death burst forth into life. The resurrection is God's reaching into the world with boundless love to gift us all with new life and a new beginning. Since this story was first told, people have told it boldly. The proclamation, Christ is risen, is met with an affirmation, Christ is risen indeed. This call and response can be heard on Easter morning in communities all around the world. When you say it, in just a moment, Imagine the voices echoing this good news back to you. And not just from the corners of your room or sanctuary, but from large cathedrals and remote villages across the globe. In a moment, I'll say, Christ is risen. And you are invited to respond, Christ is risen indeed, with the fullness of your voice and your body. Shake off your own stillness and let us reach to embody the scope of this good news. Reaching high up to the sky, like you're praising God, like you're surrendering to the wonder. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Reaching way out to your sides, like you're sharing your love, like you're embracing your neighbor. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is, is risen indeed. indeed. Reaching far out in front of you, like you're being called into the world, called to this very place in this very moment to live this good news. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. This Easter, let the story of resurrection move you. Let it shake you from stillness. Let it open your imagination and expand your hope. Let it grow your sense of what is possible in your life and in the life of the world. Amen. Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, as we turn now to your word, open our hearts, open our minds, open our lives that as we make this journey to the tomb, we might understand anew the power of resurrection, that we might live our lives anew with your love, a love so strong that even death could not contain it. We ask it in your name, amen. Our scripture reading for today comes from the gospel according to Mark reading the eight verses of the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting to the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. The one you are looking for, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, he has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. 
So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here ends our reading. If I were to choose a favorite account of the Easter story from the Gospels, I think that I would choose Mark. I like Mark because Mark does not mince words. Mark only tells us what is absolutely necessary. And I like the way Mark ends the Easter story. In fact, his whole gospel, he ends it with a cliffhanger and he ends it with fear, which feels far more natural to me. That's what Mark does. It's not victory, it's not triumph, it's uncertainty. The women go to the tomb expecting to find what they had left there, Jesus, the one that they loved, their Lord. They were there when he was placed in the tomb. They saw, Mark is very clear about that, they saw the stone being rolled into place, a very large stone, and so reasonably, when they go back to the tomb, they think that Jesus will be inside of it. It is a reasonable expectation to find things where you left them. And how are they as they go to the tomb early in the morning? Well, they're sad. They're devastated. They're disoriented. They're grieving. They're heartbroken. And when they arrive and find that the stone has been moved, and that there is a young man in a robe sitting inside? Well, how are they then? Well, they're still sad and devastated and disoriented and grieving, only now they're alarmed too. They don't know what's going on. The man, who is thought to be an angel, tells them what we already know, but they do not yet understand, that Jesus has risen. He is no longer there. The angel tells them, do not be alarmed. Look, there is the place where they laid him, but go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And then they run away. They are amazed and they are terrified. And because they are afraid, they tell no one, Mark reports. In Mark, there are no resurrection appearances. There is no walk on the road to Emmaus. No doubting Thomas. Mark ends his gospel with women who are afraid to tell what they have seen. It is an unsettling ending. And in generations after Mark concluded his gospel, it was tried to wrap it up a little more neatly. Twice they tried to write different endings to the gospel of Mark, things that left it a little bit happier or a little more understandable. But that's not how Mark intended it. He ends it with fear. And when you look honestly at what was going on in the world at that time for those women, a response of fear is not out of line. Brian Blunt, president of Union Presbyterian Seminary, has written, this is why the emotional content of chapter 16, the first eight verses, is fear. The fear is appropriate not only to this ending, but to the entire gospel. The women now fear, as Jesus says, he will go before them to Galilee to restart the ministry that ended so tragically in Jerusalem. Fear is a natural reaction to a discipleship whose content is the way to the cross. Anyone who truly understands what it is to be a disciple of Jesus is a little bit afraid. If you're not afraid, Blunt writes, you don't understand. This is why Mark doesn't want to stress resurrection appearance that will wipe out the fear with a victorious ending. Mark does not end with a victorious ending. He ends with silence. 
And on the surface, it may seem like the women have failed. They don't go and tell. But did they fail, really? Because after all, aren't we here? They did tell, just not in the moment, not in time for Mark to record it. After all, we are here. They did tell, and so did someone else, and someone after that, and someone once again. They did tell. My colleague Heather Shortledge says, I can't read Mark's version of the story without confronting with what so many label as the women's failure. Only fear, flight, and silence. But cognitively, we know there's a direct relationship between breakdown and breakthrough. Sometimes we have to fail before we can start to grow. I'm not usually a fan, she writes, of contemporary self-help gurus, but Cynthia Oselli spells it out rather clearly. For a seed to achieve its greatest expression, it must come completely undone. The shell cracks, its insides come out, and everything changes. To someone who doesn't understand growth, it would look like complete destruction. Maybe, Heather concludes, the women had to feel the weight of their silence before they could find the words to tell their story. The women didn't fail because where Mark ends his gospel is not the end of the story. The story was still unfolding even as Mark concluded his writing. The story is still unfolding before us. Resurrection is still happening. And we are still being surprised and alarmed and rendered speechless by Jesus. And if we aren't, are we really paying attention? Resurrection is still happening with crocus and daffodils bursting forth from ground that just a few weeks ago was frozen. Quarantines that are beginning to loosen, vaccination rates that are going up just as infection rates are going down. Resurrection is still happening, but it takes time for it to happen. And it takes time for us to take it all in and to bear that weight so that we can tell the story. Now, as much as last year's Easter felt more like the original Easter with its aloneness and its isolation, this year's Easter, I believe, is much more like the disciples' response to what is happening. As we begin to emerge from this last year, I find that we are unsteady and uncertain and tentative in taking steps forward. And that's okay, because we aren't the same people as we were 14 months ago. And that's good and heartbreaking all at the same time. And so the ground we're walking on does feel a little uncertain. We should be patient and deliberate about how we move forward so that we can move forward faithfully and thoughtfully, prayerfully and hopefully about how we will open ourselves and this world. I find that we forget how to do even basic things because it's been so long. At least I have found that. Even things like simple everyday conversations. Early on in the pandemic when we were all still at home and everything was shut down, Ben and I were out for a walk with our dog, Aspen. When we encountered one of our neighbors across the street and they shouted a greeting and asked how we were doing, well, without even thinking, I piped up and said, great, we're having tater tots for dinner. Well, the neighbor looked a little quizzically at us and then smiled and moved on. And I was left to say, tater tots for dinner? Who says that? What kind of response is that? It felt like I'd forgotten the most basic of human interactions, what to say and how to behave. So we have to relearn things like basic conversation. That's, of course, an easy thing. 
but we're also going to be learning and relearning hard things like trauma and grief that hasn't been processed. What impact is this past year going to have on those who are most vulnerable, those who have been most isolated, those who have had the greatest need, many needs which have gone unmet? Grief that has been delayed and new griefs that are still unfolding, things that went untended as the world moved on. But make no mistake, friends, resurrection is happening, and we are opening up, which gives us the opportunity to be more faithful, to think about the words and the actions we want to use to tell this story, this Easter story we have been given, to follow Jesus more closely. And all of these things we cannot do if we keep looking and living and focusing on the good Friday Jesus whose body is still in the tomb. I cannot help but wonder if maybe we have finally been cracked open enough that we might be able to grow, grow new roots, new sprouts of faith, to bloom with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, have we finally been cracked open enough that we can grow into the beautiful flowers God has created us to be? As Neil Donald Walsh has written, yearning for a new way will not produce it. Only ending the old way can do that. You cannot hold on to the old while the new, while declaring something new. The old will defy the new, the old will deny the new, the old will decry the new. There is only one way to bring in the new. You must make room for it. The women did not fa fail because we are here. Jesus did not stay in the tomb. He was resurrected and is on the loose in the world. And Mark's ending is not only abrupt, it leaves the ball in our court. As Brian Blunt concludes his writing on this passage, he says, God needs people to fight with cutting and living words. God needs people to live out sermons of life and hope for people who have none. Sometimes, churches and Christians want their word, not God's word. We need to give and live God's word anyway. Finishing Mark's story, God's story, he writes, is not a simple thing. If it were, those closest to Jesus surely would have managed a way to conclude it. Fear overwhelmed them, Mark writes. We mustn't ever believe that a faithful person is a fearless person. Faith for Mark is not being without fear. It is refusing to let that fear silence you and the gospel message you've been commissioned to carry. Faith is what God makes possible in you so that you can see your way to the goals God has set for your life and for the life of God's people. This is the Easter story as told by Mark, and it is not finished. We don't know who told who first found words, what woman first articulated what she had seen. But that is not the most important question facing us today. The question is not who told, but who is telling? Because Mark is still waiting for us to tell the story of the Messiah who lived, who was killed, and who was resurrected, whose love was so strong that it could not even be contained by death. And the telling we are asked to do cannot be contained by words. It must be lived and practiced again and again. Who told? No. Who's telling? Let's tell. Amen.
friends, having heard God's word read and proclaimed, let us affirm what it is that we believe. This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Alleluia. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness can never put it out. Alleluia. This is the good news. Once we were no people. Now we are God's people. Alleluia. Christ is our peace, the indestructible peace we now share with each other. Alleluia. Part of knowing the risen Christ in our lives is knowing the privilege and the gift it is to give. If you would like to give to Old Stone Presbyterian Church, you can mail your gift. You can drop it off in the mailbox. You can give online by going to our website. You can bring an offering when we have in-person worship. But however you give, wherever you give, let us know that the world is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who dwell in it. So let us give God's tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. Risen Lord, it was early in the morning when the women discovered that you were no longer in the tomb. Early in the morning, and they weren't sure what they were seeing. They were afraid, and they were amazed. So it is with us, Lord. So it is with us. We know that there is good news this morning. But God, we aren't always certain how we should or could respond because the world doesn't always seem ready or if we're being honest, we don't always feel ready. But we do know, Lord, that this day changes everything. We leave this place changed, turned, open to new possibilities for living into Easter in this Good Friday world. So help us, Lord, we pray. In your mercy, hear our prayers. Help us to look for you in the places that you are already blessing. Inspire us as we look for words and actions to reflect the magnitude of what you are doing in our lives and in this world. Help us when we fall short to receive your forgiveness and share that forgiveness. And for those who aren't so certain, Lord, the doubters and the disconsolate, who maybe aren't even sure why they tuned in to worship today, other than that deep knowing that they need to be in a place where something greater is being proclaimed, grant them a double measure of grace. Surround them with those who can encourage them and assure them of your love for a season and maybe more. For we know, God, that you're calling us out into the world where people are hungry and children are crying out. There is homework to be done and relationships to nurture, parenting to be practiced, griefs both fresh and familiar that require tending. Lead us, Lord, as we do our best to live our lives in ways that are faithful. Open our hearts to see you, to know the sacredness of tears and laughter, the gift of a kiss or an outstretched hand. Keep the good news of your resurrection close at hand to remind us who we are and whose we are. 
for we ask this and all things in your name and in your words. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, having heard God's word read and proclaimed, let us affirm what it is that we believe. 
This is the good news. The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Alleluia. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness can never put it out. Alleluia. This is the good news. Once we were no people. Now we are God's people. Alleluia. Christ is our peace, the indestructible peace we now share with each other. Alleluia. Part of knowing the risen Christ in our lives is knowing the privilege and the gift it is to give. If you would like to give to Old Stone Presbyterian Church, you can mail your gift. You can drop it off in the mailbox. You can give online by going to our website. You can bring an offering when we have in-person worship. But however you give, wherever you give, let us know that the world is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who dwell in it. So let us give God's tithes and our offerings.